Hi. It's great to be able to join in here today at the second Azure Cosmos DB Conf. Having worked with Azure Cosmos DB at the core of multiple cloud native solution architectures for numerous, numerous years now, I'm really eager to share some of my experiences with the wider community. I will be elaborating today on the topic of leveraging um, Azure Cosmos DB as a driver for data-driven change, with an especial focus on performance and cost optimization and also security. So who am I? Uh, my name is Christoph Axelsson. I work as a principal uh, cloud solution architect and have more than 20 years of software engineering experience. I have leveraged Azure Cosmos DB as the core component in multiple data-driven uh, workloads across European and global markets in recent years. Uh, I'm also the founder of Access on Cloud Consulting, a consultancy company with subsidiaries uh, in three countries, providing expert services and consultants in cloud native computing and digitalization in Microsoft Azure Cloud. I chose the topic uh, of driver for data driven change, as it's inevitable that we are quickly entering the data driven economy. And there is an increasing awareness among enterprises, organizations, and other entities of the benefits to be or to become data-driven organizations. In order to accommodate that, we must, of course, have the data. And when we have it, how we store it, and what capabilities that solution has, uh, of course, becomes of uh, importance in order to enable data-driven digital transformation and innovation. More and more business entities and organizations are understanding the importance of understanding their data, analyzing it, gaining insights, and thus enabling better AI, machine learning, data-driven decision-making, and, um, and using it for enabling um, new business models and increased organizational and operational efficiency. Even though there is this rising awareness of what can be done through data, how to reach there in practice may not always be so straightforward. In this session, I will go into real world examples and experience from leveraging Azure Cosmos DB as the core component when implementing and deploying data driven cloud solution architectures and digital, service, uh, digital services at global scale. I don't think it's likely that the vast amount of data currently being ingested and created across the globe will just lie around and its potential remain untapped. A lot of this data stems from Internet of Things devices. It's sensor data, which is by nature often semi-structured JSON. I think there is immense potential in data, in the ability to use it for gaining efficiencies and thus enabling more value creation, enabling better sustainability and to drive digital innovation. High quality data and data sets are foundational for creating high quality AI and machine learning as well as, as mentioned before. A recent interesting in, uh, report uh, from McKinsey and Company uh, is touching upon where we are headed. As it can be seen here, it says that data practitioners are increasingly leveraging an array of database types, including time series databases, graph databases, and NoSQL databases, enabling more flexible ways of organizing data. This allows teams to query and understand relationships between unstructured and semi-structured data easier and faster which accelerates development of new AI-driven capabilities and the discovery of new relationships in the data to drive innovation. Combining these flexible data stores with advances in real-time technology and architecture also enables organizations to develop data products. Those able to make the most progress fastest stand to capture the highest value from data-supported capabilities. This report is named the Data-Driven Enterprise of 2025. This report is not covering a far distant future. It's, 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 it's covering the expected future, the expected norms uh, to be uh, um, expected in just three years, in 2025. So things are moving quickly. But how does this tie into the capabilities of Azure Cosmos DB? And what are some of the benefits of a fully managed POS service such like Azure Cosmos DB? Well, first of all, uh, the pricing model is completely consumption based. And depending on which um, uh, provision throughput model, provision throughput model you choose, there is not even a lower requirement for any provision throughput. We will get into that a bit more in a bit. 
There are multiple abstractions and open source APIs as well. There's unparalleled scalability, including auto scaling of collections based on real time load. There is point in time resource, uh, resource from continuous backup built in as part of the service. There is a 99.999% read availability SLA on all multi-region database accounts. Server-side retry policies, as well as advanced security capabilities such as, as virtual network service tags for network isolation, data encryption, and short geofencing and data governance for sovereign regions, IAM with Active Directory-based role-based access control, etc. But just like when building a house, it's pivotal to make the right choices from the start. Once the construction has begun on the foundation that you have laid, it's not easy to change the house being built or that has been built on top of it. It can be done, but it can be costly. The same goes for uh, cloud solutions as well as software architecture as well. You can save a lot of time by making the right and informed decisions from the start. Here I have collected some points that I think are important when starting out utilizing Azure Cosmos DB in a cloud solution architecture. Choosing the right abstraction is of course very important. Even though Cosmos DB is an SSD backed unified tuple storage, the data uh, stored and residing within as well as capabilities and to some extent integration with other services may be dependent on the choice of abstraction. For many workloads, the SQL API would be the go-to option. It integrates well with other services and it often gets uh, early previews of new features. There are many MongoDB on-prem solutions out there and MongoDB also has the, uh, distinct data types. If a graph database and complex relationships needs to be maintained, then the Gremlin API could be something to consider. I recommend analyzing your need carefully, not just the current need, but also any potential future need on the roadmap. Even though it's easy to migrate uh, to and from different sources and database types uh, using the Azure Cosmos DB migration tool, it's still an unnecessary cost. Selecting the throughput model is important for both performance and cost, and is very dependent on the use case. Shared throughput is a great feature uh, for cost, but uh, there is a limitation on 25 collections per database though. Even though shared uh, provisioned throughput on the database level can be good from a cost perspective, how it scales horizontally across uh, collections or containers can be hard to guarantee, especially in conjunction with autoscale. I'm using both the term collections and container here. Um, container is the most common term, um, and most commonly used term, but uh, when using the MongoDB API abstraction, uh, which is uh, somewhat um, 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 uh, being mentioned in this, uh, throughout this session, uh, it can also be called collections. I'm going to use both of them uh, during this presentation. Uh, the best practice is to provision the throughput on the container level for the most consistent results. In practice, I have sometimes used the shared provisioned throughput in use cases where cost consideration is of particular importance, importance such as in certain QA and, and test environments but kept it at uh, the provision throughput at the uh, container level or collection level for any and all pr uh, production workloads. Um, if using autoscale, don't forget that there is a multiplier of 1.5 on the request unit count and cost. Still, in my experience, the elastic scaling of autoscale is usually worth it uh, by far and will reduce the overall cost significantly, uh, especially in scenarios with occasional spikes in traffic. The serverless throughput model uh, is a really interesting addition ad added re relatively recently and perfect for intermittent and unpredictable traffic. For instance, applications with relatively low traffic most of the time, but with some heavy spikes. A scenario that I think many real world use cases out there may have and that I've certainly come across earlier. Uh, unlike the other models, which usually have a minimum throughput of 400 request units per second, uh, the serverless mode does not have any such minimum limit, and you're only charged for the request units consumed by your database operation, operations and the storage consumed by your data. Choosing the partition key is one of the single most important design decisions for a new collection or container. Cosmos DB is designed to scale horizontally based on the distribution of data between physical partitions. 
Fiscal partitions are fully handled by Cosmos DB. A logical partition, though, consists of a set of items that have the same partition key. And the partition key is something that we can select and choose ourselves. So that is something we have control over. The recommendation for maintainable data is to select the most granular partition key that you can. In a previously deployed workload, I used the native uh, MongoDB object ID as the partition key. The object ID was created based on a reproducible matrix uh, to create a 24 short uh, string, uh, 24 short long string, and based upon a unique combination of data properties to ensure cross-market uniqueness, which made it a good fit for, uh, for being used as a partition key, since each key is completely different and unique, and meaning it had high enough cardinality to enable good scaling, something that also helps with the performance, of course. Indexing is something that we will go into further uh, soon. Successful optimization for performance and cost can entail many aspects. And some of them I've gathered on this screen, on this slide. As we have touched upon, throughput configuration is one of them. Understanding when to use autoscale is another. Don't forget to enable retry policy, the retry policy feature. It's not enabled by default, and don't forget to set the number of free tries and maximum wait time in the Cosmos client options if needed. However, I would say that understanding your application behavior and understanding what is causing latency or not, and optimizing accordingly, are probably some of the most important aspects in creating a good performance for your application. For instance, if you know a certain type of query represents the majority of requests overall, request unit consumption overall. Optimizing that query will yield significant performance and cost improvements. But any optimization like that is of course based on insights. We will discuss that and server-side pagination, bulk execution and in-memory cache in the next slides. In this hands-on demo, I have two collections based on real-world dev data that is in turn based on production, uh, real-world production data. Each collection have a few million documents, and we will see how we can analyze a query made based on a server-side pagination filter and how it behaves in an indexed versus a non-indexed collection. The first collection, the one named invoices that we will see soon, have multiple composite indexes or multi-key indexes added, <coughs> added to it previously. Uh, while the other one, uh, the one named invoices no index, does not have uh, any indexes except for the default wildcard ones. Let's see how many uh, documents these collections have. Let's start with the invoices, with the indexes. We see it has about 2.2 million documents. Let's now see the one without indexes. It has about 2.3 million documents, so about the same. Pagination. Uh, yes, uh, next I have prepared a sample query. Uh, it's based upon the filter from a .NET Core based REST API with server side pagination enabled and used both on the server side on the, in the REST API and on the presentation side in the UI application. Pagination that makes multiple but smaller requests to retrieve only the data that you actually need for a given page review rather than large queries will usually be more efficient overall. Don't forget that streaming the data to the client can also be a culprit for slow performance, even though uh, the server-side uh, um, uh, query execution speed looks quick. Therefore, it's in everyone's interest, usually, to apply server-side pagination wherever applicable to only and, and to only retrieve the data actually needed on a given page review, uh, and keep the document's size and, of course, returned response size uh, if served through, for instance, a REST API as small as possible. On the DB query side of things, uh, projection can be used uh, to only include uh, the relevant fields in the query. In this query, we see that a certain customer ID has been selected. We see also that uh, there is a date filter uh, greater than uh, April 18, 2021. We also see that the sum net should be greater than 100. And here we are seeing the projection where we want to retrieve the due date and the sum nets in our result. Next, we see the limit and skip. These are the server-side pagination 
uh, properties used to, to limit the query. This is basically equivalent to a page size uh, of 100 and the first page. We are not having any skip enabled. Next, we're also having uh, the execution stats enabled, which is a MongoDB uh, uh, option to enable um, an uh, extended insights and query performance uh, metrics. Let's now execute the query on this index collection first and see what happens. We see that we have about 100 retrieved, a, docu a retrieved document count of about 100. We see that the retrieved document size bytes is, is around, around uh, 81,000. And we see that, that, <laughs> that the output document is about 100. Let's now ex execute the same query on the collection without the composite indexes or multi-key indexes and see what happens there. Let's copy it and replace the collection name with invoices underscore no underscore index. See what happens. You see the difference in the retrieved document size and the retrieved document uh, count. It's returning 200 documents instead of the 100 documents that we are actually asking for. And the return size is about twice as large as on the previous query. This can have many reasons, but one of them could indicate that we're doing a scan or traversal as the retrieved document count is the number of documents Cosmos had to load to in order to consider your query. So far, these stats are MongoDB native, uh, but let's put this into the Cosmos DB uh, context and remind ourselves what the request unit actually is. A request unit is an abstraction of the system resources such as CPU, IOPS, and memory that are required to perform the database operations supported by Azure Cosmos DB. The request charge of a given operation correlates directly to the size of the document. The more documents we need to traverse and read, the higher the request unit consumption and thus cost uh, uh, may, uh, may be. So what we're actually seeing here is the reason for why a collection with a lot of data can drive higher costs, unless optimized properly. Even though uh, Cosmos DB has wildcard indexes, composite or multi-key indexes needs to be added manually. In this case, I'm, adding, uh, I'm using uh, Studio 3T. Let's add an index. Specify your keys and optionally give the uh, index a custom name. Uh, don't forget that index names uh, needs to be unique. I'm specifying the customer ID, due date, and subnet with the sending order. And specifying the custom index name as well. There we go. Let's run it. Running. Adding the proper indexes based on your application's behavior and the most uh, used types of queries is key to achieving good performance and cost. Getting the, index, uh, getting the indexing operation started can take a while sometimes, um, but eventually we will see a result here where we see that the amount of indexes uh, have grown by one. We will see a result of the indexes before and the indexes, uh, indexes after uh, we run the command. And if successful, it will have increased by one. Let's see if it shows up. It might take a bit of time. There we go. As, as mentioned, we have one, uh, we have two indexes before, one of them probably being the wildcard index mentioned earlier. And now after having success, success, successfully run the command, we now have, now have uh, three indexes with the composite index being the newest one. Uh, the, the index operations on large collections, collections uh, can take some time. You can use the db current ops command 
to retrieve the status of the um, uh, index build process. Don't also forget if your query, for instance, in code is using multiple sort properties. The query will throw a 400 bad request if the composite index uh, has not been added. Therefore, don't forget to create your indexes supporting your queries and sorting requirements before launching any, for instance, app updates, and, uh, including new sorting capabilities to your environment. In this screenshot from a real world production environment with some figures blackened out for confidentiality, we see the results of the right optimization in action. Even though used by thousands of active business users across multiple European and global markets uh, and used as the unified data source of curable reports through all data feeds in Power BI, as well as the, source, the data source for thousands of daily notifications, as we see on this screen, Azure Cosmos DB only represents a fraction of the total uh, Azure environment cost in this particular case. The bulk execution feature in Azure Cosmos DB.NET uh, SDK version 3 is a great feature for large bulk imports and can import more than one terabyte of data per hour. And it can also uh, perform patch updates. For other APIs or abstraction, uh, for other abstraction APIs, uh, similar um, uh, um, imports can be can be achieved by uh, splitting up the data into chunks or tasks that are executed in parallel through asynchronous programming. Lastly, I would like to touch upon how Azure Cosmos DB ties into data-driven data solutions. We are just at the beginning of an exponential uh, uptake in the data ingestion into enterprises, businesses, and organizations globally. According to the European data strategy by the European Commission, it is, it is expected uh, that there will be a 530% increase of global data volume, up from 33 zettabytes in 2018 to 175 zettabytes in 2025. And it is estimated that the data economy will be worth 829 billion euros across the 27 member states of the European Union by 2025. But how can we tap into this value? And how can we leverage Azure Cosmos DB in practice to become data-driven? Azure Cosmos DB in conjunction with other Azure services such as, Azure, uh, such as serverless Azure Functions, Azure Event Hub, Azure IT Hub, and Azure Kubernetes Service enables resilient, performant, and secure real-time and event-driven architectures at scale. ChangeFiend, an official Azure Function trigger bindings, makes it easy to get started developing data-driven services. And the flexibility and open source nature of the official Azure Function trigger bindings, as well as good documentation, makes it easy to create and customize your own input bindings if needed. On the screen here is a simplified diagram of a notification send out flow. It is especially the left part of the screen here that is of interest. What we're seeing here is a previous mode of operation where the solution had a time triggered uh, function app uh, queuing for updates based on a certain date time property uh, in the documents in the collection. It, and it did so daily during work hours on weekdays, once every minute, and then performing some custom logic for determining which of the changed or created documents that should actually be, uh, become a notification and then putting uh, the, uh, a message on service bus queue for the ones that should. In this old mode of, mode, in this old mode of operation, uh, in worst case, there could be up to a one to two minute latency or delay until the end user actually received the notification. Note the change in arrow. Instead of pulling changes by constantly curing a given collection, we are instead pushing or actually listening for change events streamed on the change feed through a host processor, and then triggering a function app execution run on each of those events. And now some of you may ask rhetorically, uh, yeah, but currently it's not possible to filter out certain events uh, streamed on the change feed. Won't this approach cause massive amounts of function app uh, runs, depending on the amount of creates and updates in the collection? Well, yes, it will. But if there is one thing cloud-native Azure services are good at, 
uh, and that of course includes Azure Cosmos DB and Azure Functions. It's the ability to scale, making them one of the perfect fits for large scale data processing. The ability for Azure Function apps to scale within an app service plan, plan is unparalleled. And depending on how it's configured, uh, how it's configured, it won't incur any high cost either in my experience. Of course, there are aspects to take into consideration in order to help Azure Functions to scale well within an app service plan. But that's a topic that falls outside the scope of this presentation. To continue on this diagram, uh, since the change event actually, actually contains the changed uh, document, we don't really need to curate that collection at all, at least not directly. Uh, even though a change feed approach will also consume some request units, my experience is that it's overall a lot more efficient than a pool-based uh, solution. And then we're entering, of course, the benefits of this data-driven approach. What are we actually gaining from this approach? The most obvious benefit is, of course, the performance or reduction in latency. Instead of waiting a minute or so until the end user gets the uh, notification, now instead it's uh, sent and received in a matter of seconds. As the, uh, since the entire architecture has become data and event driven. The real-time aspect is the most obvious benefits, of course, but, it also opens up, but this approach also open up, opens up another world of possibilities as well. Right now, we're having an email ser uh, service uh, delivery and uh, Azure Notification Hub on the right side of this, of this uh, screen. But it could just as well be combined with Stream Analytics. Why not Event Hub? Uh, for enabling, for instance, real-time actionable insights or analytics in other consuming applications on the right side of this architecture diagram. The pace of new, cap the pace of new capabilities and features uh, is high. And there has been some major improvements and capabilities added to Azure Cosmos DB throughout the recent years. For instance, like the point in time restore self managed through the Azure portal UI, the server side retry policies, the serverless capacity mode, the portrait document updates, the shared uh, throughput on containers on the database level, and also uh, uh, relatively recently and currently in preview, the in memory cache and also the high storage pro, uh, low throughput program, uh, completely negating the need for a 10 uh, uh, request units uh, provisioned throughput quota per one gigabyte of storage that is, has been usually required. Really great for vast, really big data uh, scenarios. Uh, a tool uh, that I'm often uh, uh, using and have been using throughout the last couple of years is the Azure Cosmos uh, DB capacity calculator. You can estimate the request unit consumption based on the document size, the reads, and the writes. And that is of particular importance as uh, writes consumes a lot more, considerably more um, uh, request units than a read does. Also included here, here is the documentation for how to configure and enable the in-memory cache, the integrated cache mentioned on the previous slide, a really exciting feature. And also, if you want to take the cost optimization even further, uh, there is, of course, the reserved capacity available for Azure Cosmos DB that can be used to optimize costs um, to the next level. Depending on the agreements uh, and, and what you purchase, uh, you can uh, save up to 60% of the Azure Cosmos DB cost through, res through reserved capacity. I thought I would uh, include some contact details uh, as well. Having any questions on the, uh, how Cosmo, Azure Cosmos DB was leveraged in these projects or how it could perhaps be leveraged in utilized in your workload, feel free to reach out for a chat. Contact details on the right side of this uh, slide. And with that, we have reached the end of this presentation. Server-side retry policies, consumption-based serverless capacity modes, uh, shared throughput, self-managed point-in-time resource, uh, from continuous backups, enabling a uh, restore of the last known configuration or the last good data in a matter of minutes, enabling data resilience, partial document updates, and even more coming up in the near future for really, uh, uh, for really big data workloads and more on the horizon. Having worked with Azure Cosmos DB as a pivotal component in data-driven cloud-native solution architectures for uh, the latter half decade, 
And given the unparalleled scalability, and not to mention the near uh, real-time actionable insights through Azure Synapse Link and the limitless storage without any upper limit, and given the multi-regional rights and geo-replication across our globe as part of the service, I think it's certainly no exaggeration to say that Azure, Cos Azure Cosmos DB is indeed an enabler for data-driven digital transformation at planet scale. Thank you very much. I hope you've gained some valuable insights uh, from this uh, session. I really appreciate you joining in on my talk here today at the Azure Cosmos DB Conf. Okay, that seemed to have gone fine, looked fine. Um, only really one edit that I have to make. Yeah. Um, it came in a little long, uh, about six minutes over, but I think we're fine. Yep. All right. Okay. Yeah. So we got it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really happy, you know, to to be able. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm really meaning what I'm saying here. I, I have been using Azure Cosmos DB for more than six years. I mm -hmm. I have really, you know. Um, I remember hearing some cloud native off the record, you know, cloud native developers saying, oh, Cosmos DB, it, it's, it, it can be so expensive and the performance, you know, we need to scale the resource, uh, the, sorry, the request units so high in order to get good performance. But I have not, you know, I've not seen that. I've seen that if you optimize it properly, if you know your, you know, indexes, if you know why queries take time or not, if you can ensure that traversal is not actually occurring, uh, you can achieve so much better, you know, you can achieve, achieve really great performance and and low cost. And then you begin to reap instead all the benefits of a managed service. So yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to be able to, to uh, yeah, to have had this presentation. I'm, I'm really, yeah, I really think uh, Azure Cosmos DB is one of the premier cloud native uh, POS uh, services in, in Azure. Great. All right, so I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna make some changes, just small edits, and then uh, it'll be live on April 19. Uh, if you have any questions or anything in the meantime, you know how to get in touch with me, but I think we're all settled. Great. So happy. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Cheers. Have a good day. Yep. Yeah. Bye now.